Uh, good evening, Cornerstone family. Pastor Mike here. You know, last Sunday, Pastor Milton taught us about how our lives need to match sound doctrine, how to behave with good spiritual hygiene. What do we do if we know that we have bad hygiene, however? Or worse yet, what do we do if we're happy in our sickness, uh, not knowing that we're actually diseased? And so this week in our pastoral devotions, uh, we're uh, calling it, or uh, the topic is God's treatment for your sin. Tonight, I'm actually switching places with Pastor Carlos Price, who will be teaching tomorrow, Lord willing. And so this evening, I'd like to talk about how God chastises us in our sin, giving us time to repent. God chastises us in our sin, giving us time to repent. And let me just set the stage, first of all, with a grand view of of the purpose of scripture. I'm not sure how familiar you may be with the Bible, but uh, well-known Christian author and speaker, Paul Tripp has three uh, nice summaries for us to consider as we approach the scripture. First of all, he says, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but the Bible's not arranged by topic. The Bible is not arranged that way because of editorial error, but because of divine intention, unquote. Uh, the Bible is a grand redemptive story, and that's the way the Bible operates. By grace, God is embedding my story and your story into the larger story of redemption. And um, as we read about the themes in Scripture, sin, grace, love, wrath, redemption, uh, Christ's return, we see our little stories within the big story, and that's how the Bible works. Um, but secondly, we live... As we read the Bible, we realize that we're living in the middle of a story. We've entered in the middle of the movie, as it were. There's things that have already happened before us, and there's things that have not yet happened after us. For instance, the world has been created. <clears throat> Good. We have a fall. We have Jesus Christ who's died on the cross. And it's been promised that uh, forgiveness can be had through faith in Jesus Christ, and that one day all enemies, including death, Satan, and sin, will be placed underneath Christ's feet. But we live in the middle of the story where we do not yet see all of Christ's enemies underneath his feet. So it's been guaranteed, but it's not fully experienced yet, which brings us to a third thing to consider as we read our Bibles. And, that the, and that's the Bible is the world's best diagnostic. Nothing explains the human struggle like the word of God does. The Bible alone offers the world's only workable cure. An effective cure is always attached to the accuracy of diagnosis. You get the right diagnosis, then you can have the right cure. The Bible exegetes the human struggle with precision, and so we can go to it and trust it for its cure. Which brings us to the narrative that we're going to consider over the next few minutes, and that is the fact that David spares Saul's life twice. This is a story that, as we read it, we try to figure out where do we fit in this story and what is the grand story of redemption that's going on here. Uh, I'd encourage you to read these full chapters on your own. We're just going to basically summarize some aspects of chapter 24 and 26 in the book of 1 Samuel. And what we have here is David. It's been promised that he will one day be the king. He worked inside of uh, Saul's administration, however, after he uh, killed Goliath and and was actually uh, one of Saul's uh, uh, commanders and generals. But Saul begins to grow jealous and realizes that David is uh, the future king and begins to pursue David and try to kill him. But what we have in chapter 24 is while Saul goes out with 3,000 trained soldiers to try to kill David, uh, in the wilderness of Engedi, he comes to a place called the Rock of the Wild Goats, Rocks of the Wild Goats. I love that title of, of this area. And it just so happens that uh, Saul needs to go attend to his needs in a cave, which probably means he needs to go to the comfort room, or the restroom. Little does he know that David is in the cave with many of his uh, best soldiers, and, and he's right there. Uh, within knife shot of David. And so David could take his enemy out right there in the cave. But David decides not to do that. He decides to cut off a piece of Saul's robe, 
mercifully lets him go. And once Saul would have been far enough away for it to be safe, David reveals himself and basically says to Saul, hey, I had you right in my hands. I could have taken you out, uh, but I had mercy upon you. Uh, Saul looks back. He realizes what had just happened, that he could have easily been dead. But David, the future king, has mercy upon him. And we at least have this temporary type of change or repentance that's expressed from the lips of Saul, where he does proclaim that, that David is going to be the king. And he asks David to swear in verse 21, Therefore swear now to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me, and that you will not destroy my name from my father's house. And David does swear this. And we find in future chapters that uh, David actually begins to take care of Mephibosheth, um, Saul's grandson, and shows him great kindness and mercy as Mephibosheth, a, a crippled young man, uh, eats daily at the table of King David. Fast forward to chapter 26, we have another scene. Uh, Saul's repentance is short-lived, and uh, he finds out that, uh, that uh, David is in the wilderness of Ziph, and he heads out again with 3,000 trained soldiers. David sends some spies out to see where Saul is, and um, it turns out that Saul and his protector, General Abner, and everybody uh, lays down for the evening uh, to sleep. And uh, Abishai, one of David's generals, they come down into the camp. And Abishai says this in verse 8, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth and I will not have to strike him a second time. This was when Saul was on spear. Saul was asleep with his spear next to his head in the ground. There's also a jar of water right next to him. Abishai wants to take him out. Instead, David has mercy again. He says, no, I do not want to kill the Lord's anointed. I'm going to let the Lord fight my battles. Let the Lord take vengeance. Uh, verse 10, David says, uh, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day will come uh, that he shall die, or he shall go out into battle and perish. He's going to let the Lord uh, take things. He's going to wait on the Lord, as it were, uh, before he becomes king. Again, uh, David and Abishai, they go up into the mountains when they're a safe dis distance away. They cry, they call out to Saul, awaken him, and say, hey, I had you right in my hands. I could have taken you out, but I didn't. I showed mercy. What are you going to do? And Saul, again, has this feigned repentance from his lips, says, yes, David, you are the king. You are more righteous. Uh, may the Lord repay you. And then they part ways. We know that Saul's life does not end well. When you fast forward just a couple chapters, it's sad to say that Saul, at the end of his life, is not hearing from the prophets anymore. He actually consults a witch, a medium, and who prophesies that he will die in battle, and he does. And so ends a sad tale in this grand story of redemption. What does all of this mean? Well, you know, the Old Testament, we have the story of the rise of David and this kingdom in the Old Testament that God is bringing in through very small means, this little boy who kills Goliath, who then serves Saul and then is on the run. And the Lord is protecting him as he waits on the Lord. And eventually he does come to the throne and reigns over all Israel in this grand period of Israel's history. But David points to another person. He's called the son of David. We see this in the book of Matthew chapter 1. The son of David is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And the son of David also has a kingdom and a throne, and he's been promised by his father that all of his enemies will be placed under his feet. And so let's ask ourselves a question. How many times has Christ spared my life and yours? You know, in 1999, I had a mole on the back of my back. Uh, I found out through diagnosis that it was melanoma. And if I had not been given that diagnosis, I could have easily died. Uh, but I went and had surgery, and I'm alive to this day. And I believe it's one of the ways that God spared my life. He allowed me to have a sickness uh, that awakened me to spiritual things. And today I'm alive 
uh, and and kick in and hopefully more healthy spiritually because the Lord had reminded me of my mortality. Um, you know, Christ has the right to take our lives. God has given the throne to Christ. He sits at his right hand awaiting uh, the necks of his enemies to be put under his heel by his father once and for all, the Bible tells us. He has the right. He also has the power to execute justice, and he will. The Father has committed all judgment into the hands of the Son, the Bible tells us. He has the right, and he has the power. And yet we, stewards, servants like Saul, are the pretenders. We should and must give Jesus the crown, but instead we pursue Christ as an enemy. By nature, before we're born again, we slander him, we lie about him, we exalt ourselves and thrust the spear at whomever would question our authority. What will Christ do when he visits us in the cave, as it were, when he comes upon us with the spear and jug at our head while we slumber? Will he strike us down with the knife of his righteousness? Will he bid his angel Abishai to pin us to the ground in the spirit of Jael? He has the right, he has the power, and we are the pretenders. But what does Jesus Christ do? He waits. He does not strike. He may cut off a piece of our robe. He may take our spear and jug, but he waits. He shows mercy. He does not judge before the appointed time. He takes from us trophies to demonstrate his mercy and his patience. This kindness and mercy he shows us plainly, which is meant to lead us to repentance, the Bible says. And what shall we do with such kindness? Shall we be Mephibosheth? a cripple who sat at the table of David, or shall we be Saul? Are you the anointed of the Lord, let's ask? In one sense, you are all anointed because you are human beings made in the image of God. The Bible says a little lower than the angels, but some of our race will judge the angels, and some of you are anointed in another sense. You are anointed with the anointed. You are beloved within the beloved. You are sons and daughters within the Son, Jesus Christ. He has passed over you because you are his own by faith. Well, how do we know if we are Saul or Mephibosheth? How do you know if the son of David merely passes by you as a temporary mercy like Saul, or if you will sit at his table in his kingdom? Lay down your crown. Lay down your spear. Strip down and prophesy willingly and say to Jesus, You are Lord, I am surrender. King David escaped from Saul, but the son of David, Jesus Christ, was caught. He came under the weight of our sins and was pierced for our iniquities. Soldiers cast lots for his tunic and his clothing was divided. A spear was thrust in his side and he was given gall and wrath to drink. Jesus was not spared, the nails pierced, the spear cut. The father struck him and did not need to strike twice. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. The king allowed himself to be caught and killed for you and for me. And that was just the beginning. He was raised up and walk the earth. He was raised up to the heavens above. He was seated next to his father, and he is returning soon to bring all his Mephibosheths home and to judge his souls. Where will you be? He extends you time. 
He extends you mercy. Call upon him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is true for you. This is true for your household. This is true for all who live on Christ's earth. If you'd like to comment about this devotion or others, you can Instagram us at cornerstone underscore Bible or email us with your prayer requests and praise reports at prayer at cornerstonebible.org, prayer at cornerstonebible.org. God bless you.